and we can get started. While Neil is doing that, uh, I just want to mention that if you ask any, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can just put it on the chat box. I'll take a note of every single question, and at the end, we'll get them all answered for you. And yeah, that's it. Cool. All right, you can see a full screen presentation, Vignesh. Yes. So, hey everyone, thank you for coming. I look forward to teaching you guys some more cool stuff. Uh, in this module, there is three lessons, so some of them are pretty short. Uh, we'll take quick five-minute breaks in between them, and it's funny. We'll just do some like random SEO talks and stuff. You're on. Derek's on. Is Jared on? He's as well. Carlos on. Yep. I am. Hey, good seeing you in Brazil, by the way. Yeah, it was awesome. Real pleasure. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I hope you enjoy the Indian food. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. It was great. I haven't okay. tasted it before, but it's really nice. Uh, thank you. So, all right, so this week we're going to be breaking down on page and technical SEO. Again, some of this stuff will be basic, some a bit more advanced. I'll go through all of it. And of course, if you implement the stuff we're teaching you, you will see better and better and more results. The big thing with SEO is you have to make the changes quickly. If you don't adapt to the market conditions and you don't continue to optimize your site for SEO, other people are. And these other people are gonna continually outrank you. So in this week, it's all about on-page and technical SEO. Next week starts getting really fun for me. I do like on-page and technical SEO, but my favorite part of SEO tends to be content marketing. And that's what we get into in the next few weeks, so I really look forward to that. Um, but nonetheless, the SEO stuff I'm gonna to explain to you today and outline is really important. The first thing you need to know when it comes to on-page SEO is Google loves finding and sharing linkable content. So your content pages that get linked the most, whether it's internally or externally. Internally is you have five pages and they all link to, let's say your contact page, right? That's an internal link. Me linking to your contact page is an external link. So internal is you on your own site linking to other pages on your site. External is someone else linking to your site. Whether you have internal links or external links, or ideally both, that's what Google loves. Now, when it comes to SEO, the first thing that we need to discuss is optimizing on-page factors. These are things on your own website. Off-page factors are elements like me linking to your website, right? On-page factors tend to be your own website itself, the code, the content. It's stuff you can control. You can't control external factors like me linking to your site. You can influence them, but you can't control them. If you're wondering how Google sees your website, it's not like this. So you go to the right side, you can quickly see like in a little screen or you know, forget even that screenshot. If you just go to your own website, what you see isn't really what your site is. There's a site or tool called Browse SEO. And when you use Browse SEO, you can put in a URL to see how search engines see your website. This is how Google sees your site. You see it's all zeros, ones, numbers, code. That's pretty much it. They're not seeing images like you're seeing image. They don't see an image of a Toyota Camry and be like, oh my God, that's a beautiful Toyota Camry. It's a computer. Sure, AI is getting more advanced, and as it gets more advanced, the way Google sees your site is gonna change, or at least I believe it's gonna change. But for now, Google sees it in basic code format, such as headings, search engine previews, if you're blocking any robots, if you have Twitter descriptions, the amount of text you have on your page, right? That's how they see it. And you can use Browse SEO to see how Google sees your own website. It's free. There's 10 essential on-page SEO factors that we really need to look at. And within each one, 
you know, it, it changes in which there's multiple parts to each one. Some are really simple. And what I wanted to do is just break down the main blocks. And then from there, we can dive into them and I can show you some examples. So this is the simplest one, titles. You do a Google search. What do you see? You see a blue or purple link. Purple means you clicked on it. Blue usually means you haven't clicked on it before. The link is uh, this one that you can see is Content Marketing Made Simple, a step-by-step -step guide, Neil Patel. That is my title tag. The keyword is close to the start, and I have a modifier. A modifier could be things like buy, guides, review, online, offers, cheap, 2017, 2015, 2020, whatever the year is. What we found is modifiers really help increase clicks. Without the modifier, your title can be keyword rich, but if no one clicks on it in Google, then they're not gonna rank you as high. So let me give you a scenario. Let's say you have a website, and you're ranking number one on Google. And hypothetically, if everyone does a Google search in that month for the keyword you're ranking for, and they click on the number two result, and they skip your listing. Now these aren't robots, these are humans, right? Some of them even have Gmail logins, they have history, they've been using Google for years, and they all decide to skip your listing and click on the second one. What do you think will happen? See, Google's goal is to rank everything for users, not search engines. So if everyone is just like, oh wow, you know, number two is better than number one, they all click on it, it tells Google to put the second one above the first one. That's click-through rate. The more people that click on a listing, the higher it also moves. It's not just keywords, it's also how many people are clicking. And that's why you wanna add modifiers to your titles. The next thing you need to look at is headlines, right? So a headline, what I found, the ideal headline, if you're having something simple like how to sell your house, you ideally wanna change it to something that maybe has some numbers or a trigger word. Adjectives really help. You wanna make sure you include your keyword somewhere and a promise. So a before example would be how to sell your house. And I'm sorry for the yawning. I'm like jet lag and I was at the airport for 10 hours straight. They canceled my flight. And then from there, they gave me another uh, flight to get on. But like it was just exhausting, such a long flight. I think it was like 14 hour flight in addition to the 10 hours at the airport just sitting there. Okay, so long story short, you have the before how to sell your house. And then assuming you're using trigger words, adjectives, and a promise, it would be something more like how you can effortlessly sell your home in less than 24 hours. Do you see how that's more attractive? How to sell your house is basic. What was if someone's on a time crunch? When someone's looking to sell their house, they ideally want to sell it quickly. Or they may want to sell it for a lot of money. So it could be how you can effort or how you can effortlessly sell your home for more money than your asking price. That's a bad example, but you get what I mean. It's another creative way. The promise has changed. Instead of 24 hours, I'm talking about selling your home above asking price. So it'd be something like how you can effortlessly sell your home for above asking price, right? That could appeal to people as well. So those are different examples of the promise. Now here's some head headline tips that I've learned in general, and I've tested this really thoroughly. So one, six word headlines tend to convert better than 10 words or 20 words or even three words. Now here's why. If it's three words, you're not really figuring out what the headline is about and what you should be clicking. If it's 20 words, it's getting cut off and it's just too long. Six words is roughly the sweet spot. You're not gonna always get six. You may have seven, eight, nine, ten. You may have five or four, but aim for six as a rule of thumb. When you add numbers, I found that that helps with click-through rate. You always want to use adjectives like we described in the previous slide. And um, negative words work with really well. So the thing with negative words is you have to make sure you're not too negative with everything. Because if every single piece of content on your site had negative words in your headline, it was like, you're such a negative Nancy, right? And you don't want to be negative all the time, but you can test it out here or there. And if you use it too often, it loses the effect. The most important part, though, with the headlines and, you know, your website is if the headlines 
don't match the content, it's not going to go well. So, for example, I remember I read an article once of something like, Steve jumped out of an airplane without a parachute. And what happened next was shocking. Or, you know, Steve jumped out of an airplane and uh, learn how Steve jumped out of an airplane and survived without a parachute. I'd be like, wait, how is this possible? But, it, you know, if the content is like, yes, the airplane was still on the ground. It wasn't fancy or it wasn't high up off the ground or it wasn't even flying. Then I would be like, oh, that's just silly, you know, like um, it, in that aspect, I'd be like, this content just sucks. So you have to make sure that it matches what you're trying to pitch within your headline. So the next thing when you're writing your headline is you also need to write them for shares. If you don't understand the goal of your audience and why they would read it or the value it would provide, they're not going to share it. It's funny, you know, at the same time, I always see people putting social sharing icons all over their contact page. Yes, social shares can indirectly help boost your rankings, but no one's going to share your contact page, right? So if you want to share your content, what's the benefit from? What value are they getting? If they don't get any value, they're not really going to share it. And you have to look at each social network separately because your content isn't going to be appealing for each and every single one, so don't write for all of them. Right for the ones where your audience is. With your headlines, the other thing that I've learned is I've tested out a lot of different stuff and so have other people. BuzzSumo, who tracks social sharing data and what makes people do well or poorly, they did something cool, right? In which, if you're using BuzzSumo, um, you can see all the people who are popular out there. But what I like BuzzSumo for is not necessarily that, more so their data. And they have different articles. Um, one of them is how to write engaging B2B headlines, right? And what I found for B2B, I know a lot of you guys are in B2C. I found that it works the same too. I've tested in both. So two starting words, right? Top two words or phrases. How to, the X. X is like a list number, like the seven most or seven things or seven ways. Top ten ways. What is the best seven reasons this is why you, right, you can see what they are. You guys will have a recording of this uh, presentation, so you can end up just going back to this if you want. And other ways, right, when you're looking at phrases, and it's not just two-word phrases, what I found that's effective, and I use this data from BuzzSumo, I tested it out myself, I found that X ways too works extremely well. If your audience is really sophisticated and educated, replace ways with maybe like strategy or uh, tactics or techniques, something that's a bit more sophisticated. So for me, when I tested X ways, like 10 ways to, it doesn't work as well as, it still works well, but it doesn't work as well if I put like 10 techniques to, right? Um, 10 techniques to double your SEO traffic or whatever it may be, or 101 uh, techniques that'll double your SEO traffic. When I get a bit more advanced, because my audience is a bit more advanced, it works a lot better. So you can test and play with it. You can adapt and change the words and phrases a bit here and there, but this is general rule of thumb. Also, when you look at uh, headlines, top numbers and length of shares, it's actually quite interesting, right? So a lot of headlines are different lengths. Um, some of them have like 10, 20 words, some of them have 15 words, but you can see the graphs here. So uh, again, like five, six word headlines tend to do extremely well, as you can end up seeing based off this data. Once it gets too long, the numbers just tank. And the reason being is too descriptive, or if it's too short and it's a one word headline, everyone's like, I don't really know what this is about. The tools that you can use to figure out what are popular headlines, BuzzSumo and Epictions, will end up showing you what's popular on the social web. Ahrefs will show you what's popular when it comes to search. I know Ahrefs has social data. I just use Ahrefs purely for search data, and it's really good for that, right? Social data, I found BuzzSumo to be a lot better and more user friendly. The other thing, and this is the third factor, is your first 100 words. What are your first 100 words within your blog post, your website, your web page, whatever it may be? A lot of people take this for granted, and I have no idea why. Sure, Google's not looking at keyword density as they used to, 
But if your first 100 words have the keyword, you're much better off than if they didn't have the keyword. So consider adding them. Internal links, and this is really important. Google crawls your website by browsing the links that are on your site, right? So if you're linking out, they're continually taking those links and then they're figuring out, all right, with these links, uh, what other pages are you linking to? Which ones are the most important? Should we index this page? Should we not index this page? Oh, you're linking to this page a hundred times from your own website. Wow, this page must be really important if you link to it. For example, your home page is like that. And that's how Google crawls your website. They just keep going and going, they dig deeper, right? So you can choose what areas of your site are gonna be crawled. And a lot of that happens through internal links. If you don't do a good job with internal linking, you're not gonna do well from a ranking perspective. And just look at Wikipedia, right? So you look at Wikipedia here. Have you ever wondered why they do so well? Every article on Wikipedia is interlinking to another Wikipedia article. And then sadly, when they link up to your home website, they no follow. It's like, man, it's like, give me a do follow link. You know, it's like, hook a brother up. But nonetheless, Wikipedia, they always do internal links. And that is why they rank really well for everything. It's technically, it's a combination of external and internal links, but still, right? It's so effective. Now, here's your website, right? Most websites are like, all right, here's my homepage and let's link to three pages. Well, you want to cross link, you want to get more detailed, you can link to more pages. And keep in mind when you're trying to control the flow of your website, right? If you no follow specific internal links, it doesn't really help. You shouldn't no follow them. I know a lot of people do this because like, oh yeah, I want to pass more juice to this other page. So I'm going to no follow all the other internal links. It doesn't help. The way Google handles it now is you're still splitting the link juice evenly, just a portion of it gets wasted if you're no following internal links. As for your internal links, here's an example of one, neilpatel.com slash keyword dash research. And you can put in whatever anchor text, the anchor text there is keyword stuffing anchor text. The point I'm trying to make with this slide is you want it to sound natural. So if someone's reading your blog post and you know, you're mentioning keyword research, you can keep your anchor text keyword research. You should make it flow supernatural. It's like, it could be like, oh yeah, you can click here to learn keyword research or this guide to keyword research. It has to be natural and relevant. You don't want it to be like super spammy. If it's super spammy and it just includes keywords, what you're gonna end up finding out is you're gonna eventually get, your internal links are eventually gonna hurt you and then you'll find that those pages won't rank because they're just too rich in anchor text. So aim for at least three to four internal links per 1,500 words. Now this doesn't mean that you can't link out as well. So in your 1,500 words, you'll probably link out five to 10 times. And by doing this and linking deep within your site and only link into your site when it makes sense, don't just link for the sake of it, you'll find that your rankings over time go up. This is so effective. I have an editor who works for me full time just doing internal links. I kid you not, just full time going to all my content, adding the right internal links. Now external links, and we'll discuss this in the upcoming weeks, this is what builds trust. The more websites pointing to your website, the better off you are. Google knows you control your own internal links. What they don't know is hey, do other people trust you? So they figure that out by looking at how many other websites link to you. Because if a lot of them link to you, then they're like, oh, cool, this site's trustworthy. We should you know, uh, keep using this site and ranking it higher because a lot of other people are linking to it, just like Wikipedia. Now, a, a good example, if you look at the image, an internal link is link A is the top image, going to test.com slash A, it's your own domain. Uh, link B is another website, xyzt.com, linking to Z or QZ, yeah, that tongue twister, qzd.com slash B. That's an example of an external link. And eventually I'll show you into getting more external links. And as the weeks go on, you'll start seeing more and more advanced stuff. So with the external links, the best practice is getting links that are keyword rich or anchor rich. So when they're anchor rich, it helps, but it has to be a nice blended balance. You can't have all your external links pointing to you that have your keyword in there. 
because then you're probably just going to get penalized and you won't rank well. Uh, and we'll show you this over time. But as you're building these external links, make sure that they're just really on topic. A lot of people that I see building links are buying them and they're trying to scam their way to the top. The links don't make sense. I'm like, yes, you have a dog site linking to your dentist site and you have nothing to do with dentist or dog teeth. So why would you have a dog website linking to a dentist site? It just doesn't make sense. For me, on the SEO site, I could have business sites linked to me because they can talk about marketing and you know, hey, if you want to grow your business, check out neopatel.com. I could have another marketing site that specializes in paid ads linking to me or another SEO site even linking to me, which is probably the best. And the other thing I do is when you find other sites that you want to source, make sure you link out to them. It's okay to have external links. Yes, you want to link, you want other people to link to you, but you also want to link out to other websites that are good for you. The reason being is it shows trust. This will tell Google like, hey, this site right here, it's very relevant and you know, I like this site, I'm linking out to it, it's great, so I should be placed in the same neighborhood. Right, does that make sense? So if you keep linking out to all the other marketing blogs in your space that are ranking well, eventually they're gonna see you as the same neighborhood and the same type of site as those sites and because they rank higher, it'll help your rankings as well because Google sees the trust factor. They want you to link out when it makes sense. Now, URL structure. I make this mistake one too many times. I used to have my URLs way too long. I'm going back right now and cleaning them all up. As I shorten my URLs, it performs better in my rankings climb. So take all your ugly URLs and make them shorter uh, and don't have too many subfolders. Try to have medium or keywords in there, right? You want to have long tail as well as head tail keywords in there, but don't get too specific. Once you get too specific with your URLs, your rankings will tank um, because you only rank for the specific terms. So for example, I have an article on getting indexed in Google and the URL is so specific, I don't rank well. But if I change the URL, and which I did, instead of my URL being neilpatel.com slash blog slash how dash to dash get dash index dash instantly dash in dash Google dash quickly, that's like so long versus it being neilpatel.com slash blog slash Google dash index. Right, you see the difference? Because now Google's want to rate, gonna wanna rate me for any term that people type in that are super specific, such as getting indexed instantly in Google. But if someone's just typing in a general term like get indexing or Google index, how to get indexed in Google, I'm not gonna rank as well because my URL is too specific. So dates, in my URL, I grew my traffic, many of you guys have heard this story, by over 50% through one simple change. I removed the dates. Because Google was seeing all my content related to a date, I removed them, I made my URL structure way more simpler, my ranking skyrocketed. Didn't really do much more than that. Just shows the power of removing dates. Because then Google's like, oh wow, this post is related to this date. Oh, that date was two years ago, we shouldn't rank you as high. Removing all the dates, they're like, oh wow, this website is related towards anything, not just dates. And they just started ranking me higher for everything. Worked extremely well. So another factor in your URL stream is HTTPS. I haven't noticed it increasing traffic from using HTTPS, but Google's pushing everyone to use HTTPS. So if you have form fields and the form fields on your site, you know, don't have an HTTPS in the URL, to start giving people warnings within people's browsers. So make sure you're using HTTPS for that reason, even if you're not gonna get more traffic. Maybe later on that'll change, but for now I'm not seeing traffic increase from it. So here's some general tips for your URL structure. Use hyphens, not underscores. Um, you're, and you don't wanna use multiple dashes in a row. So you don't wanna put neil, neilpatel.com slash blog dash dash one. Right, you can do neilpatel.com slash blog dash one, whatever it is, one dash. You don't wanna have two dashes in a row. The URL could have multiple dashes, but it can't be word dash dash word. It could be word dash word dash word. So multiple dashes are fine, but just not dash dash together or and try not to use any underscores. Always use lowercase text. 
If you use uppercase text, it just gets complicated. Some people won't come to your site because it'll start bouncing back. Make sure your characters are safe. In other words, don't use extraneous characters like quotation marks, ampersigns, uh, percent signs, you know, up arrows, all this kind of stuff, exclamation marks, like all these type of extraneous characters, they just hurt your rankings. Google hates them. And try to not use more than two folders in your URL structure. The simpler your URL structure, the better off you're going to be. Next section, readability. I know people are like, how does readability affect my on-page SEO? Well, think of it this way. If you go to a page, if you go to, well, let's go back a step. If you do a Google search, you click on the listing. The website is really hard to read. What do you do? You click the back button. That's user metrics, and that's something that Google is looking at. Poor user metrics means poor rankings. So if you want to improve your metrics, make sure your stuff is really readable. And the way you can make it very readable is short, simple words, right? Don't use really advanced words. People don't want to be felt like you're smarter than them. Everyone wants to be able to connect with you like your average show. Make your words really simple. This is why the people that go like Harvard and Stanford, naturally they have amazing vocabulary and they're using all these words that people can understand. You also want your sentences no more than three or four lines. When it's three or four lines, it's much more digestible versus if you have like seven or eight lines. If you want to write in an active voice, use the words you or I. Use subheadings to break up your paragraphs, right? Because when you do subheadings, it breaks up the section of your site and makes it really skimmable. If you want to use images throughout your text, write every 7,500 words. Sometimes you can put more images or less images, but you get the point roughly around there. Uh, feel free to use quotes from other people, block uh, quotes, right, which is formatting within WordPress, lists or call to actions. That just helps make your con content more digestible and easier to read. So images, this is another thing. Picture says a thousand words. People don't want to just read text. Pick images that support your content, blend in, and make sense. You want to create your own images if possible because that helps more than if you use other people's images like stock photography. I use stock photography, it's because I'm lazy, but I should be using my own custom images. Make sure you also compress them so that way it helps improve the load time and consider the dimensions that you're using for images and make sure they're compatible with social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and usually they always are. It's the super tiny ones that aren't, so when in doubt, just go bigger. The other thing with your images are Google can't read an image, right? AI is gonna change and sure it'll get better over time. But for now, you can use alt text to describe your image as well as titles. So in your source code, you can see from this image here, it says image SRC equal or equals quotation mark Neil Patel dot JPEG and quotation mark. All should be Neil Patel. Title should be Neil Patel. Title is a tooltip, so when you hover over an image, that yellow little box, that's a tooltip. The alt is something that Google picks up as well. The title tag, that tooltip, is something that a lot of uh, programs for blind people use, and Google likes ranking sites that are compatible for everyone versus sites that aren't. Um, you also want to make sure your image is very descriptive. So that if I only had one image of me, then I could just put Neil Patel. If I have multiple images of me, I can do like, you know, Neil Patel, Neil Patel wearing a white t-shirt and a white blazer or something like that, right? You also want to consider your file names. Make it name the keyword that you're trying to have that image rank for. If you're trying to figure out where to get images, you go to flickr.com slash creative commons. These are free. Or pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S dot com. I use Flotilia. Flotilia costs a lot of money. But, you know, Flickr.com slash Creative Commons actually has a lot of amazing good images. And here's an example of me using subheadings. When you're using these subheadings, you should use one H1 tag per page, and you can use multiple H2 and H3 tags. Headings help. Google doesn't just look at if it's an H1, H2, or H3. They also look at the size of the heading, right, the font size. They understand that the bigger the font size, the more important it is. And you want to make sure your call to actions stand out. So what's the purpose of the page? Is it purpose of the page to click email or social media shares? Um, is it to drive sales? Whatever it may be, 
make sure you're making your point within your call to action on whatever page it is. And the call to action doesn't have to be explicit, like sign up here. It could just be a link being like when you're giving tips on like how to increase your muscle mass. Let's say you have a fitness website and you can be like, oh yeah, this protein powder will also help increase your results by 5%, right? And it could just be a basic texting. That's the example of making a readable call to action. You also, as I mentioned earlier, use lists and quotes. So if you're using uh, lists and quotes, make sure it's digestible. Your lists, you know, if they're gonna continue on and on. Under each list, don't try to put like 50 paragraphs. It just makes your list hard to digest. You can also try infographics. I found they to work extremely well, right? Um, the other thing that you should end up checking out is I have a whole blog post on my website. It's either QuickSpot or Neil Patel on how much does content marketing cost, and I break down how it's cheaper than paid ads and the results that I got. Another one I ended up discussing was how to measure content marketing. And what I found is if you're in B2B or B2C, the easiest way to measure it is you look at first entry source in your Google Analytics and you can see who's coming from your blog and then if they end up turning into a lead. And the other thing I ended up learning through content marketing is it impacts SEO more than any other thing that I've seen out there. Without the content, I don't care how many links you have, you're not gonna do well. Uh, and you should be doing content marketing for B2B especially. If you have B2C, you should consider it but you don't have to make it a priority. But in B2B, it is one of the best channels. In B2C, it still is a channel that's amazing. If I had a rate on a scale of one through 10, 10 being amazing, for B2B, it's a 10. For B2C, it's like an eight and a half. You can also use video. Video helps improve engagement. Are you guys familiar with the Google Panda update? It penalizes thin content. So they're not just looking at word count, they're looking at like which content sucks, how much people are engaging with it, when you add videos to your pages, people stick around longer, you're less likely to get hit by the Panda penalty. Uh, you also need to know if you're not familiar with, Google owns YouTube, so putting those YouTube videos on your own website also boosts your own YouTube rankings. They look at that as one of the factors on how many views are your video getting from external sources, are people embedding them, because that just tells YouTube like, hey, this is amazing content. And of course, sharing stories through video format builds trust, and it keeps people on your site for a long time. The next factor to think about when it's on page is LSI, also known as latent semantic indexing. So think of it this way. If you're typing in Windows, does that mean you're looking for Microsoft Windows or replacing your own home window, right? Funny enough, I had a break the other day and if I typed in Windows right now, I'd be looking for a replacement window. The point I'm trying to make is Windows has many multiple meanings, just like the word Apple. Is it Apple the food or Apple computers? Google's getting smarter and smarter at figuring out what you're meaning and what your page is about, because if you're talking about Windows, the computing software, you may mention Microsoft, you may mention the edition such as Windows 10, you may mention mobile or desktop or laptop, right? These are all examples of latent semantic indexing. Google's looking at topical relevancy. They're looking about every single keyword on your page to figure out what you're talking about. Are you talking about just Windows you know, for your home or are you talking about the software? And without analyzing your whole site, forget just the page, it makes it hard. But because Google crawls every single page on your site, they're able to do this. Now, here's an example, right? Uh, if I end up Googling SEO consultant, I'm seeing SEO consultant for all these different cities. Um, and the beautiful part is Google is bolding the relevant keywords that is relevant to what I'm searching. So Google knows what kind of content you're going after based on what people are typing in to search. And they have all this history and pattern on you and the results you will see is different than what I will see. So for social sharing, there's a lot of free tools that you can use to get more social sharing. Hello Bar, Sumo, great examples of free tools that you can use for social sharing. Um, and when using this, you don't have to pay anything. You can check them out, add them to your site. It's a great way just to get more social shares. And now what I wanna do 